Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 4, 2015. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but I don't have to cover this week, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. I actually uh, got a little overzealous and I popped my top a little early, so you just have to imagine that I popped the top. And uh, there we go. All right. Well, uh, well, I have a sip of Dew. You can look at the disclaimer screen or take a look at the short version. All predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay, we would talk, what are we? Yeah, what are we going to talk about? Well, let's talk about the TKO. Getting a lot of questions on the TKO. And one thing I guess I have to realize is I've been looking at these things for twenty something years, so a lot of things that are obvious to me aren't obvious to everyone. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. I'm getting a few questions about some stocks that I've mentioned recently so we'll flesh that out too so rather than tell you what i'm gonna tell you let's just jump into the chart so i was asked about uh this stock and what my action would be now keep in mind with my it depends on market conditions and how the stocks that i pick in the landry list are sometimes if there's not a whole lot of setups you might see something like this which is not the most cleanest most beautiful setup in the world but it's something that catches my eye, and that's why I'll put it in my so-called Landry list. And in this particular case, you can see the stocks in a bit of in a pretty good trend. Um, it's had a pretty good run, though, pretty fast, so that makes it a little dangerous. And it's also a little bit thin. You can't see it, but over here um, on the other screen, it's a pretty thin stock. But it has pulled back a little bit. It looks kind of interesting. So uh, I would not go after it now because it's already rallied up and triggered on that one but let's take a look at this other one uh this is a little bit more to glean now this is an ipo and one of the newer ipo patterns that i've been talking about lately if you go in and watch the ipo webinar i did recently and if you have the course um i think i mentioned it in the course but you could see that the ipo here came public and i talked quite a bit about how a lot of times they just come public and just die and you want to avoid trading them when they do that at least until they take out their opening range day. And in this particular case, it just dropped. But one thing that I've noticed, and this is one of the newer patterns, is that sometimes they do bottom out and get their act together and then begin to take off. And there's still some excitement in them. And a lot of times they can go back to those old highs, which in a case like this would be a double. So I was asking how I would play this now. Uh, I think yesterday, the day before I got asked. And the answer was just hold on to the position because you had a really nice bow tie coming off of an all-time double bottom. Obviously, it's not that much trading because it is an IPO. And it depends on when you played it. If you could have played it back here or a second entry maybe would have been around around here. And then just continue uh, with the position. I mentioned this one actually in the IPO course a couple of weeks ago. So the way you would, what you would do now is nothing new, but you would stay with the position. So on both of those, just stay with them if you took the trades. Now, this was a potential short and what did it do? Well, if you use a fairly liberal entry, if you squint your eyes, you can see it did take out this prior little low in here. But you want to use an entry a little bit further away from the market. You want to give them a little bit of wiggle room just in case they come down a little bit and then turn around like this one did. Now, there's nothing to do here. You can see it's actually going back up and made new highs. So this would have been a trade that you would have avoided. Now, I don't really like it a whole lot as a possible new setup. In a case where you have a top like this, I like to see it take out that top decisively and then pull back before I reconsider it as a position. And here's another one. Now, this one was not on my list, but I was asked if this was, a, I was asked some questions about it being a TKO. And I guess I was being a little obstinate because I kept saying it's not a setup, so let's not talk about it. And they kept asking me about different bars, or what about this bar, what about that bar? And I'm like, it's not a TKO, so why would I talk about it? I, and I guess in hindsight, I was a little obstinate. So I made some slides on TKOs, which we'll cover here in just one second. Uh, but the reason I didn't like this stock at all was it's at 22, and you go back in time. Oh, about a month, and you can see that it's at 22 since so made no forward progress. Also, I'm not showing it on this screen, but the HV is 22 or 20 something. Okay, I think I got 22 in my mind, maybe 23. I could look at it in a minute. 
it's Western Union too, and it trades like fifty billion, million, zillion shares a day. So it's it's a very efficient stock. It's something that I wouldn't be very excited about actually trading. The other thing to realize is it's taken it months and months and months to go up about ten percent. And we had a stock in a portfolio that went up almost ten percent yesterday alone. Now, I don't want to digress too far. But if you go back in and watch my webinars, I've talked quite a bit about volatility being better than the devil you know, okay? And my point there is you're much better off trading a more volatile stock and trading fewer shares and trading a less volatile stock and trading more shares. Furthermore, if you were trading something like this, you would have to wait for a very long time, likely, for that move to happen. And in that time, something bad could always happen. Now, something bad, of course, could happen in the volatile stocks, but you have on fewer shares, and also the chances of something good happening first are also a good thing. And then in the end, you will have to give up some of the trend. Okay. So it's just not a stock I wanted to talk about because it's not a setup, and, and I'd hate to talk about a bad setup when it's pretty much meaningless. And the thing about it is you have to realize that – my slide's a little mixed up. You have to realize that – and this is something that I covered in the, in the stock selection course that I covered it the other night in, in, the, uh, in the introduction video on stock selection – is you want to study success and focus on success. Don't study these mediocre stocks. The point is that these counterfeit currency traders, counterfeit currency traders, listen to me, I got trader on my mind. I got currency trading on my mind. Um, counterfeit currency detectives, they learn how to recognize a fake by studying the genuine article. So they look at the currency and they study all of the attributes of a real currency. And by doing that, when there's a fake, it's very obvious. So there's no need to study the fakes. You want to study the genuine article. And that's why I, I kind of beat this guy up a little bit. By he, he said, well, what about bar number five and bar number three and take a look at bar number two? And I'm like, it's not a TKO. I don't want to talk about it. You know? So you're better off finding something that looks like this. Now we can talk about it, okay? And this is what a TKO should look like. And if you watch that stock selection webinar, I use this exact uh, example. And you could see that. That's not, that's nothing to do back here, but the trend was working its way higher, and then it began to accelerate. So at this point in time, this should raise an eyebrow. This should be on your momentum list, or certainly once you have this knockout move, you should be ready to go. Now, think about what a TKO is. It's a knockout, and I guess I sort of made the mistake of saying that it should take out at least the prior two bars. Well, that's just one of the rules. I probably need to add it a rule that says it's on a wide range bar. So let's call it wide range bar. Now, as soon as I say this, somebody will say, well, how many bars? I don't know, eight. How's that? Uh, it's got to be the widest bar out of the past eight bars. Uh, but I would not quantify that. I would just eyeball it. So when you look at this right here, this is obviously a wide range bar down, almost to an extreme. Almost, this is on the cusp of being too much. But they should be this obvious. They should sort of hit you over the head and not be like this um, pattern here where it's like, okay, well, what, what, what bar is your knockout bar, okay? Because there is no knockout. It doesn't exist. So getting back to, to this one, my slides are mixed up. Sorry about that. You can see it's pretty obvious and that there are also some great things that are also happening within the trend. Now, don't, never take a setup in a vacuum. Always look at the actual stock and what's going on. Now, there's a lot of variations when it comes to the TKO. 
Dave, uh, why when I register for the webinar, I don't get a link to log in? I have to register when you start the webinar. Uh, I don't know. Is anyone else experiencing that? Well, uh, I'll have to look into that. Maybe that would um, maybe that would explain why we have hundreds of people registered and um, not that nearly that many people there. Oh, okay, huh? Okay, well let me. Uh, I'll look into that afterwards. I appreciate that. Okay, so let's look at the different types of. Um, well, that explains a lot because it seems like we're seeing. I'm seeing mostly regulars here. And I've got hundreds of new people that have registered. Oh, well, good to know. Okay. So rather than try to to dig into all these emails and try to figure out exactly what everyone's asking, I thought it probably would make sense to to do a piece today just on a TKO. And and good questions. Keep them coming. It show you some variations of them and just kind of drive the point home about the wide range bar. And then, as I'm going to mention in a minute, but I'm getting a little further ahead of myself. But uh, somebody did show me in 10 best that my, my examples weren't the best in the world. And I didn't even realize that. So I didn't make enough emphasis on the wide range bar back then. So for it back then, the TKO I just kind of saw it as a little bit more of a pullback looking pattern, but the reality is it needs to stand out from a pullback as a knockout move. Now, before we get into it, I guess it's probably important for me to explain something to you. When a stock has a strong sell off, and this is not just a stock that's just bumping along like that WU was. We're talking about a stock in a bona fide trend, ideally an accelerating trend, and ideally a persistent trend, okay? So the stock is just defying gravity and going up, 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 and then bam, you got a big old sell-off. So what happens? Well, anyone who is long the stock raises an eyebrow like, uh-oh, wait a minute, here we go. Anyone who just recently got long the stock probably got knocked out. Some of those people who have been long for a long time have gotten knocked out, okay? And uh, shorts, for some reason, shorts try to outsmart the market. Don't know why. But shorts, as, it, as a general statement, tend to have an ego about them. And they uh, they tend to try to outsmart the market, and they try to... Confuse the issue with facts. This stock has no fundamentals. This is a stupid stock. Um, blah, blah, blah. So when that market begins to sell off, they're like, aha, I told you, and they go piling on. Well, if the trend resumes, they're going to get squeezed out. So that's going to give you this nice little snapback in the direction of the trend. So kind of think of it as a rubber band being pulled back, but you're pulling it back in the direction of the trend. So let's see if we can kind of, what would that look like? So you've got a nice trend, and then just think of it being pulled back, okay? Like a rubber band being pulled back. So when it begins to snap back, what happens is the shorts get squeezed out, and any of the longs that got knocked out ha have to be willing to get back in or risk being left behind, okay? So let's talk about some variations of the pattern. Now, you need the market to make a new high. A TKO is really a pullback pattern, okay? But it's a pullback pattern that only takes one bar. So people always ask me, Dave, how many pa how many how many bars do you need to pull back? Well, if it's an emerging trend pattern, the fewer the better. Uh, if it's an established trend, then you could have you could have several, maybe ten. It all depends on the situation, how deep the stock pulled back, uh, the volatility of stock. There's a, there's a whole bunch of variables in the number of days. But a TKO could could be just one day. So if a market makes a brand new high, everybody's happy. And the shorts are thinking, hey, this stock is too high. 
and then you get this sharp sell-off, okay? And again, I can't emphasize this point enough. This needs to be on a wide range bar, okay? It should be obvious. The size of this should be fairly small compared to the most recent bars. You want the sell-off to be significant, okay? Now, we need a textbook TKO, and the close is fairly low. And even if it's if it's a wide enough bar, the close doesn't even have to be way down here. Maybe the close could be in the middle of the bar. Your entry can go right above the high. And the reason being is if it goes all the way back up to the entry, then you might just have a bona fide reversal in play. I don't know how many times I've seen a TKO look exactly like this, close down here. I put my little entry in. You could even put in a buy stop order. And then next day what happens, it gaps down, it does this, okay? Or over, the, over a period of days, it continues to implode, and guess what? You miss a losing trade. Well, that's a hard part to quantify, as I often say. But every time you have a losing trade, you not only have to climb out, climb out, you have to, excuse me. Every time you have a losing trade, you have to climb out of that hole before you can get back to profitability, obviously. So if you miss it, that's that's going to have a tremendous impact on your performance. But it's hard to quantify because you don't get any credit other than you feel good <laughs> when you miss that losing trade, okay? So, again, this is a textbook TKM. The beauty of this is you can maybe put your entry right above the high, and then once you get triggered into it, sometimes you can put your entry right above the low, or right below the low, I should say. So if it does trigger, then it comes all the way back here, then this stock has a problem. You need to get out the way anyway. Yeah, you lost money. So what? Nothing venture, nothing, nothing gained. Greg says, does a TKO with a close near the bottom of the range still qualify as a TKO? Absolutely. And you'll notice here, Greg asked the question before the slide was up. But you'll know, notice in this slide, I purposely put the close way down here. I don't actually have closes in the other ones because this is what I would call an absolutely perfect textbook TKO. Yeah, the further it closes down and it's low, the better your chances of if it triggers. And this is a big if. The if becomes bigger. Let's put a big if up here. If it triggers, then you've got a bona fide trade or a bona fide trend reversal earned away. Okay? So that's a big if. And that's really hard for that stock to recover then come right back up. Now, Here's a little advanced lesson here. Someday I'll do an advanced course, and I'll throw this in. If you're really good, or I should say not good, but disciplined at trading and got some experience, maybe sometimes you might want to play a little bit of an opening gap reversal because there's so much selling pressure on this, there's likely to be a little bit more selling pressure on the open, and then you could get in a day trade that could turn into a longer term trade. I'm not a big fan of day trading, but if you got a big picture pattern and your ultimate goal is to get into the market and ride that trend out for years and years, but you could use a little day trading technique by all means. Now, the reason I'm not a big fan of day trading is I think you go crazy. And, and I literally know of several who have, all kidding aside, from day trading because we're only wired to make so many decisions when every decision comes in motion. I was actually reading about that this morning. There's um, Denise Scholl is is where I learned learned it from uh, at a, at a seminar I was speaking at. She was the one who initially uh, said it, but I've since read it in, in different books, books that aren't even related to trading. And um, I ordered a book this morning on on that, and I'm trying to think. I can't think of the name of it because it's kind of a cryptic title, but I'll, I'll get that name for you. It's not a trading book. It's a book about how the mind works. And the point is that you do have emotions with every decision. And if you're making hundreds and hundreds of decisions every day, eventually you will burn out unless you're a special type of individual. I have a friend of mine that was an ER doctor for 20 or 30 years, okay? And then he got um, he got into an accident, which um, uh, somebody really uh, like, like rear-ended him really bad in his truck. And he's got some issues, and, and then he's retired from being an ER doctor. But he's got the he had the mentality he'd probably still be an ER doctor he has a uh, he has some small practices now uh, as instead like a emergency care uh, clinics or whatever you call them walk-in clinics uh, because he's no longer can work in the ER all day 
But he has the right mentality or the or the proper mentality or whatever you call it. The, the right, not the right mentality, but the proper proper psychological makeup to be able to handle those decisions and all that stress. But I mean, I would imagine that even that takes its toll on him too. But the point is, you can go crazy day trading if you're making too many decisions. We're just that we're just not wired to make we're not wired for that type of stress. We're not wired to make that many decisions. There are some successful people out there that could do it. God bless them. I'm not one of them. And I would encourage you not to. And a lot of people who disagree with me come back later, months, years <laughs> later, and say, holy moly, David, you are right, David. It's, that's, my, that's what my wife calls it when I'm in trouble. David, <laughs> holy moly, Dave, you are right. But anyway, this is a textbook TKO. And you can, again, sneak in a little day trade sometimes if you have a bit of an opening gap reversal down here, okay? Now, let's take a look at the double top knockout. I think I wrote about this one in my first book, Dave Landry on Swing Trading. And a double top knockout is when you have a very minor double top. And I think I said three or four days in between. I purposely drew in about four days in here. And then you have another marginal high, okay? So this sort of looks like, okay, everything's all clear here. And remember, we're, we're playing on the psychology of the market's participants. And I was writing a little bit about psychology this morning. I, I keep a, a, a note file, uh, and I've been doing this a lot lately, and it's been a wonderful thing. I have a product called Evernote, uh, and I won't get any money if you, if you purchase it. But it's a wonderful note-taking program. Uh, and, it, and it syncs up with uh, with all my computers here and everything. And then someday, when I get a little more savvy, I'll sync it up to my phone. But I'll keep a, I don't want to digress too far. But I keep notes in that every time I think about something. And it's just been a wonderful thing. And I've just lately I've been putting a lot of uh, notes on trading psychology into it. And it'll probably grow into a, a complete course on that. Anyway, uh, but I was thinking this morning. The reason I'm bringing that up is what I was thinking this morning is that. And, and I've said this before, but I was just kind of really expanding on it in my writings uh, this morning, in my notes. Would you place a trade based on technical analysis, at least based on the way I do it, something conceptually correct that makes a lot of sense and is logical based on what the chart pattern is? There's a basis for that, and that basis is you're reading the psychology of the market participants and you're looking to capitalize on the psychology of the market participants while I'm not saying eliminating, but controlling your own emotions to do the right thing. So when you have this little double top knockout right here, everyone who's long thinks that it's the all clear because you're taking out this prior little top in here. And then when you have this sharp sell off, you're catching a lot of people, or it's catching a lot of people off guard. And, of course, the shorts are going to be really inclined to pile on to this pattern because they have a little tiny double, co little, double top to confirm what they're seeing, okay? So that's what a double top knockout looks like. And, again, not to beat the dead horse, but this needs to be a wide range bar and then prior to this of course this has to be the mother of all trends it must be very obvious a stock that goes sideways for a month or goes up only 10 percent in three or four months is not a good candidate for a tko okay now the arbalist tko is a little bit newer and i get a lot of questions on this and i was trying to come up with a way to figure out what, you know, what happens if you get the market stretched in one direction, then you stretch it back in the other direction, and what would that look like? And I, I, I got to thinking, maybe like a crossbow, but a crossbow times 10. And I started doing some Googling, like, is there such a thing or what type of weapon or, or whatever would, would look like that? And I found the, the Arbalest TKO on Wikipedia. And an Arbalest TKO is, or an Arbalest, I should say, is a crossbow, but it's a crossbow with a mechanical advantage. And you can see this little gentleman here uh, from way back in the day, back when I was a kid, uh, when we, uh, before guns were invented. Uh, anyway, <laughs> he, uh, you can see he's winding this thing, and you have a mechanical advantage, and it pulls it in one direction. And then obviously, when you shoot it, it, it just has an extreme move in the other direction. So my thinking is that 
when a market has a wide range bar up like this, it gets a, an attention, the attention of a lot of people, and it sucks a lot of people in. And then you get this TKO move, which just shakes them all out. Okay, remember, it's a trend knockout. It's knocking people out of the trend. Okay, and it's also sucking in some shorts. But if you think about it, when it comes to like the wide range bar, but Dave, how, you know, what's a wide range bar? Is it eight bars? Is it five bars? It's like, I don't know. I know when I see it. Like, uh, what's his name? Potter Stewart. But if you were knocked out, out of the trade if you were along the trade you got knocked out every now and then this happens in the service not often but every now and then we'll get knocked out of position and by the end of the day or i should say after the close i'll come back in and say hey guys i know we got knocked out of this it sucks you know lick your wounds let's move on but hey it still looks pretty good as a potential trade so i suggest we get back in and I'll actually re-recommend the same stock. I know it's kind of hard to go back to the well because that brings some other psychological issues with it. If you get stopped out a second time, then it's going to really get you frustrated. But it's worth a shot. We get paid to take risk. It's a Steve Winwood trade. If you see the chance, you have to take it. If you see the chance, you take it. Okay. So what's kind of cool about this is the market gets stretched in one direction and then it gets really stretched in the other direction all the way down here and then sometimes you get that one two and then three you get this huge pop out back to these old highs which is plenty enough for a swing trade and beyond okay okay uh steve says have you done any studies of the longest range bar doing the move higher at the proximity of the low of the tko bar i'm not sure I'm not sure I follow you. You might have to elaborate. In other words, knock the chasers out. Have you done any studies on the longest range bar during the move higher? Okay. At the proximity of the low of the TKO bar. Uh, I th I'm not sure what you're asking. Let me see if I could draw that. The you're saying the longest range bar like higher, like a bar like that? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what you're asking. Let me uh, see if you can elaborate a little bit on that. But I haven't really given that much thought other than the better your trend is, uh, which consists of wide range bars higher, the more significant the TKO move is going to be. Look at previous chart at the figure or the, or the, uh, the TKO chart. Okay. TKO chart. This one here. Well, you had a you had a big day here, okay, and that's kind of like if you think about it, um, it's kind of like sucking people in, and then and then the TKO spits them out, okay. So I think that's what you're asking. So on this wide range bar higher. It's probably it's probably opening the eyes to some shorts, and it's probably getting some Johnny Come Latelys in. Think about the Johnny Come Latelys, okay? The market is like right here, and people buy it, okay? And these Johnny Come Latelys, they they don't have a lot of staying power. They can't afford to be in a position to begin with. They're fickle. They're emotional. They're buying at the worst possible time, okay? Now, I don't want to digress too far. You could actually buy a market when it makes new highs, but you have to buy – it would have to be done in a portfolio of 100 stocks. And, and I maintain a list I call the Landry 100. I don't personally buy 100 stocks, but I maintain the list as my – this this feeds my other trades sometimes, okay? It doesn't feed like the emerging trend paid, uh, trades, but it feeds the uh, longer-term uh, trend um, – um, resumption type of trades, pullback trades, and things like that. Okay. But the Johnny come lately is you don't want these guys in the market because they're going to dump their position on top of you. In fact, part of their dumping sometimes could, could actually exacerbate that TKO, but you want to make sure they're shaken out of the trade before you get in. Okay. So in a move like this, they could shake it out. You can see by the end of the day, the stock came way back up. So it's like they shook out, not only did they shake out people, but the buyers had already started coming in, okay? Does it matter what causes the knockout? No. 
But I'll tell you this, on this particular stock, I remember thinking, when I saw this, I said, you know what? This is a bad news event. Something came out. They came out with crappy earnings or one of their drugs killed some people or something bad happened, okay? But it came up here and closed really well. So it's like, it looks like somebody got shaken out of the system. Now, the next question is, well, Dave, do you like them when they close better? Not necessarily. I mean, I'm just kind of looking at it and thinking of what happened. Uh, I'd almost prefer, I guess, you know, put a gun to my head. My wife hates when I say that. But I'd almost prefer if they close poorly so I could put my entry right above the high and trade them in a more textbook manner. If they close really close to the high, then it's like, well, geez, you know, if I put my entry right here, it's liable to trigger. And then, you know, maybe it'll go right back down again and I'm stuck in a losing trade. Whereas if it's if it's down here somewhere and my entry is here, again, it's got to come all the way back up. So we might have a bona fide reversal underway. Good questions, by the way. Uh, does it matter what causes the knockout? No. General market crisis news versus stock specific news. Well, yeah, you're going to every now and then you'll have a general market crisis, but that's OK. Especially if the market's at a strong trend because you're going to get a TKO in the overall market and then you get a TKO in a bunch of issues. Well, you don't really want to play the TKO in the overall market because the overall market is going to be more efficient. And you know me, I'm always beating a dead horse on efficiency versus inefficient stocks. And again, I would refer you back to the stock selection webinar from last week. Uh, if you poke around my columns, if you, if you go to the bottom of my website, there's like a little next button. Click on that and you'll get like all the recent webinars uh, or just join my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C as in custom slash Dave Landry. And you can get all these uh, webinars that I'm referring to. Okay. Okay, let's get back to uh, to this. So again, not to beat the dead horse on the Arbalest TKO, but it's stretched, the market is stretched in one direction and then stretched back in the other. Oh, uh, just to close the loop on that, you, you want to look for TKOs and individual issues after a general market knockout. Um, and that's okay because, because people got shaken out of the stock just the same. So, and, and if the market itself comes all the way back, then all those stocks will probably come all the way back. And if you could pick the most or one of one of a more inefficient stocks and one that's in that persistent trend and ideally that accelerating trend and also trades very cleanly, then you have the potential to make a lot more than just try to play a general uh, TKO in the overall market. So uh, is one better than the other? I don't know. Uh, I, I guess – if it's an individual event, it could it could it could have a, a, an incredible impact on the stock, kind of like that CLDX, which is my favorite example over the last year or so. Uh, but if the overall market has a TKO, you've got the overall market behind you when it comes back, or if it comes back, I should say. So it, I, I suppose it doesn't matter. I don't get caught up in the whys too much. I'm kind of a more what is is kind of guy. So that's the Arbalest TKO. Now, this I get this question a lot, and I guess I did a bad job of explaining the TKO in the books. But a TKO can happen within a pullback, too. This is my favorite time for them to happen, right after a new high. Market makes a new high, and then you get a nice sell-off right afterwards because of most people are trapped on the wrong side of the market. But sometimes you'll get a market that makes a new high, begins to pull back, and then, bam, you get a knockout move within that pullback, okay? Sometimes same thing happens, and let's say the market begins pulling back, and then you get the TKO move, and then your entry is right here above that TKO. And then let's say the next day it makes an inside day or it does whatever, and then the following day it, it dro starts dropping some more. Well, this TKO sort of becomes more like a bona fide pullback or just a normal pullback. and Depending on how far this market pulls back, sometimes I might drop my entry down, and then I'm trying to get more like a generic pullback, giving it a little bit of wiggle room on the entry. And if it doesn't pull back that far, then I just go ahead and trade the TKO. So sometimes I trade it like that, just like it's a TKO. And then sometimes it's like, okay, well, this market has dropped further. 
So I look at it like I just kind of see it as a pullback. Okay. I suppose technically once you get behind it, once you get below the TKO move, it's no longer officially a TKO, but it's just more of a pullback at that point. So it depends on how you want to look at it. But again, sometimes in these pullbacks, I'll still use that original TKO entry. And then depending on how deeply it pulls back, I'll start bumping that, that entry further down. Okay. Now, any more questions on the TKO? I have a few notes here I want to cover on them. But anything else? But yeah, I think this is a good thing for me to go through this TKO. It's a real simple pattern. It's so simple. I'm just amazed it even works. It's so damn simple. But it's 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 a very powerful pattern. And if someone's only if if you're not successful trading or you're new to trading, I think if all you did was trade persistent pullbacks, especially with TKOs in them, I think you'd do incredibly well. You'd sit on your hands a lot waiting for the market to trend, but that's a good thing because it's self-regulating. You're not going to get a persistent move with these nice TKO setups. Uh, you're not going to get them every day, and you're not going to get them when the market's going the opposite direction. Okay. Now, I just put an Arbalest TKO in here to show you, and again, this is just a very – notice this stock just kind of works its way higher, and then it kind of accelerates higher. This isn't quite a TKO here, but it's a little bit of a pullback you can see. But you can see longer term, if we drew some, uh, if I drew my trend lines a little bit better, you can see that you've got this longer term trend, and then you've got this, and then uh, and it began to accelerate straight up. It went parabolic, okay? Notice how it got stretched way up to the upside, then it got stretched way down to the downside here in this knockout bar. Also notice this knocks out one, two, three, four, five bars. So if you draw a line backwards in time, it takes out, again, one, two, three, four, five. Knocks out those bars. So anyone who bought in this area or above got knocked out if they were, or I should say they already had a loss, okay? And it, the pressure's been put on these people to bail out. And you can see when you get this big wide range bar higher, you've got a lot of people that might have got pushed into here or sometimes like the shorts, the shorts are kind of crazy people. Um, not that I don't short, we've got a short in the portfolio now, but sometimes the shorts can be a little crazy and they get squeezed out and then that market starts dropping again. They're like, aha, I'm right. And they go right back into that market because it's like sometimes I think their ego gets a little ahead of them and they, they would rather be right than make money. Okay. I'd rather be just the opposite. Not worry about being right too much. So anyway, so it's stretched one way, and then it gets stretched another. It's kind of like, again, one, two, three, and then you pop is out. And I think I got one more chart. I think that's good on the TKOs. Okay, uh, do you look at volume on the TKO bar? I ignore all volume. Uh, uh, Harry, I hope you have uh, your name right. Um, I don't look at any volume at all. Uh, if I had to use volume, I would probably use volume by price because that that gives you an idea of where the trading occurs. But I, I think using volume is a bad idea. And it, I can I could go on for about 30, 40 minutes on this. So let me just try to give you the Reader's Digest. Uh, there's no way of telling where there's buying pressure or selling pressure based on volume. Let's say a stock goes up on light volume. Somebody would say, well, there's no really buying there. But uh, if you listen to Richard Arms, uh, you know, Dick Arm says that, well, that's what I, what he calls ease of, ease of movement. And it means that they had to keep raising the bid because there were no sellers. So that's kind of a, or nobody wanted to sell at that price. So, uh, I mean, if I had to, if I had to use volume, I would probably take, um, I would take the Dick Arms approach and use an ease of movement. But nowadays you've got all those derivatives and you've got all those dark pools and high frequency trading. So, I think volume is is just don't worry about volume. Worry about price, okay, and price only. Where's the stop for the T? Where's the stop for the TKO then pullback? Well, it depends on the volatility of the stock, and it depends on where you get in, okay. So if you're in, if you're using a regular TKO way up here, and since that stock's pull back a little bit more, it depends on the wide range bar. If this is a super wide range bar then maybe you could still be down here. But usually once it takes out this bar, 
my stop's going to be a little further down. And then here's the thing too. If it depends on how far it drops, this entry is going to drop. So if we're using a sliding scale, we'll slide that stop down a little bit further. Okay. But as a general statement, once it takes out the TKO bar, it becomes more of a pullback. And then your stop is going to be at least below the pullback in a pullback. That's a, that's a starting point for a stop. But again, you got to keep you got to keep in mind the volatility of the instrument. And I think in the first book I implied your stop goes right below the low, and you could trade like that in really good markets. Okay, for a pullback that is. But in anything less, you you're going to have to be within the normal volatility of the market because sometimes, as you know, a stock will trigger come back in, retest those old lows, and then take off again. Believe me, all the market makers in the world know that everybody that's trading the pullbacks got their stop right below that low. Okay. Shea says, this volume indicates the issue attracts traders. Is that relevant? I don't know. I don't use volume. Does volume indicates the issue attracts traders? I mean, ideally, you want volume to flow into the issue once you buy it or decrease, but I'm not worried about all that. I think it's too much to worry about. Just worry about price and getting on that price. Okay. Now, again, the wide range bar is important. I can't emphasize this enough. I get questions all the time because I made the stupid rule of saying that it's got to take out at least two bars. So we get a bar that looks like, so we get a, a, a stock that looks like, let's say it looks like this. And it's like, hey, Dave, that's a TKO. It's like, no, it just looks like another day of trading. Okay. It needs to take out at least two lows, but it also has to be an expansion of range. It needs to look more like that, okay? So, again, uh, as somebody pointed out, I probably need to update the charts in, tens, in 10 best, and eventually I will. I'll probably put in that CLDX chart that uh, I just showed you, uh, or maybe I should do another follow-up. In fact, I, I've done follow-ups on that. If you, if you look at uh, Traders Magazine, and I'll try to find the uh, – let me take some notes here uh, – I'll try to find my TKO article from that. And you want to trade the stocks that look more like that. In fact, that, that stock I just showed you actually came from Traders Magazine uh, article. So let's not get too caught up in the semantics of them. It's like, and I guess it's human nature to overcomplicate things, but it's like I get asked a lot of questions uh, about like the TKO and all. And it's like, well, just keep in mind that we, this is just like a specific type of pullback pattern, but maybe the market is just a pullback and maybe it's still worth trading, even though it's not a pull, not a TKO, or maybe like I showed you earlier, there might be a TKO within the pullback or a pullback forms after the TKO. Okay. So sometimes it might just be a pullback and we trade those too. Oh, one last point on wide range bars. If it's, um, if it likely would have stopped you out or did stop you out, then it's probably a wide range bar, provided that your stops are set properly according to the volatility of the stock. And the next question is, well, where do you put your stop? Well, we've done webinars and webinars and seminars and courses just on that. But the reality is it needs to be within the, or outside, I should say, of the normal shorter term volatility of the market. Next question is, how do you measure that? Well, I eyeball it. I use historical volatility, but I mostly eyeball it. I look at the size of the bars. I look at how, the magnitude of the recent stock movement. I look at how deep the pullback is. And I also, and I don't do this by plotting an indicator, but I do this as people have kind of alluded to or pointed out. I do this using average true range without directly using average true range. OK, so if you added up my eyeballing and my historical volatility and all these other things that I do just sort of empirically, just by looking at the charts, you could probably come up with some sort of average true range to work that in. The only problem is anytime you start getting too far into the statistics of things, then um, the stop gets bigger and bigger and bigger and possibly uh, too big. If it's a purely statistical based stop, okay, so you have to eyeball it. And I do keep my stops a little loose because the looser your stop, the better off, the better your chances of capturing 
a longer term trend. And again, as I said, quite often, sometimes the only thing between somebody's success and failure is their stops are too tight and they loosen up their stops. They start catching big trends and they think big day for that. I fixed a lot of people just by telling them to loosen up their stops and I don't get paid for that, but um, it, it does make me feel good. Uh, so again, don't get too caught up in the semantics. Sometimes it might just be a pullback and it doesn't matter. You know, like I tell everyone, I don't care what you call me. Just don't call me late for dinner, right? Uh, and again, let's not forget about stock selection. I mean, I've, I've been harping, uh, I've been beating the dead horse of stock selection lately. Stock selection, there is no holy grail in trading, okay? So it's like whenever you hear that, you know, my eyes always roll over. It's certainly my wife's eyes roll when I tell her I'm going to talk about the holy grail. But if there was a holy grail, I would say it's stock selection because if you could figure out how to pick the best stocks to begin with, then a lot of these other things are to take care of themselves. So you, if you have a TKO – and it's like, Dave, look, I'm on page 56 of your book, and it says this is a TKO, and I'm looking at this chart, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, well, I don't like it, okay? It's like years ago, same thing happened. I was looking at somebody's pattern. We were talking on the phone, and I said, this is your pattern. And he says, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is. We went back and forth a few times. Finally, I said, Paige, whatever, rule number one, yep, rule number two, yep, rule number three, okay? And then what did he say? Well, I don't like it. So it's like, well, the guy invented the pattern. If he doesn't like it, so maybe I need to learn what he's thinking. So sometimes when you quantify these things, it doesn't necessarily come across at, with the author's intent, with the designer's intent in the spirit of the pattern, okay? So that's why maybe that two bar low is not enough, but I know that I want to see it at least take out two bars, but then it also has to be, again, not to beat the dead horse, but it also has to be on an expansion and range. I think I'm beating the dead horse. I'm beating the dead horse today. So never forget about your stock selection. And just ask yourself, just watch last week's webinar, and you're going to learn a lot about what you need to pick a good TKO. And that's this tiny URL here, P-V-P-O-C-J-M. Or I'll go to my YouTube channel again and um, click on it. So does it trade cleanly? Does it persist? And is it accelerating? If you ask yourself these three questions, you're going to be a long ways towards capturing some really incredible trends, established trends, that is. Okay. Um, my slides are a little mixed up. Any questions before we hop into the charts? And uh, that's from last week. Uh, that special is no longer. Uh, this special is still going on, though. I haven't set a date on this one. It seems like every time I, I set an um, expiration date, we start again with a new webinar. But if you want to get started with my core trading service, and I would say 99% of all charts and trades come out of my core trading service uh, in these week of charts presentations, uh, you can get started for 7 bucks. And just go to my store or click on products on the home page. And then when you get down to the um, the bottom of the landing page, you'll see click here for a low introductory rate. All right. If we don't have any more questions, we'll go ahead and jump into the charts. Uh, you guys can start asking about individ indiv individual, easy for me to say, stock uh, issues if you like. And then uh, we can always come back to the slides later on. I'm going to talk just a few minutes about the market and then we'll hop into those questions. So keep them coming. Good uh, good questions so far on individual issues. Um, we're getting a bit of a sell-off today, obviously. Let's not focus too much on the micro. But when you're a trend guy like me and you want to see the market making new highs, then it kind of sucks, to put it mildly, when the market is selling off after just tagging those new highs. Also, what's killing us, or killing me, is that the S&Ps are just stuck in this stupid sideways range. Now, as I wrote, I think two days ago in the column, if you'd have told me that the market would have gone straight sideways, I would have went to the beach and not worried about trading over the past six months. But we've had some really good trends during that period. And knock on wood, we have one of the better looking portfolios that I've seen in a few years. And the reason is that there have been some opportunities that have presented themselves. So 
as a general statement, you don't want to rush out and buy a bunch of stocks right now as long as the S&P is going sideways. But if you pick your spots carefully and really do your homework and see these things begin to emerge, then you begin taking these opportunities. And those opportunities have been uh, in the second tier China stocks, those stocks, in other words, coming off of low levels. Uh, beginning to that's the old pigs fly thing uh but they begin to take off nicely from these major lows we had steel and iron take off we had some south american stocks which are commodity related mostly such as south american steel and irons uh and then we had some energy plays that worked out pretty good and some of these stocks were still in we also had some ipos did really well and some biotech from back when biotech was really trending really well and we're still hanging on to some of those positions. So even though the market's going sideways, it doesn't mean that there's uh, there, there won't be any opportunities. You just have to pick your spots really careful. And sometimes you might just have to sit on your hands. And that's really hard for a lot of people. It's really hard for successful people because you have to do something to make money. You don't just sit back and relax and money just automatically comes in. You have to do something. You have to take some action. Well, in trading, sometimes the best action is no action. NASDAQ, NASDAQ, same sort of issues, just kind of sideways at best as of late. So that's a bit of a bummer. The good news is if you look at all these major indices, and we can go back to the P's for a second, and just take a step back and take a real long-term approach. It doesn't, it doesn't, it helps every now and then, I should say it doesn't hurt. It helps every now and then to take a long, long-term approach and do something like plot your 200 day moving average, okay? And as long as it's you have daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, then by all means stick with the position. And if you look on my website, let me show you, I did an article uh, on daylight for Proactive Trader Magazine. Slide down here till we get to the world tour dates and uh, click on this one right here. I'm gonna go to Detroit. Michigan. I'm actually going to be in Michigan like twice in one month. And you click on that, uh, Proactive Magazine should come up. I don't know why it's so slow. And if you scroll down here, I was on the home page. It must be the um, must be the prior article. Yeah, I was there. Well, I was there just two days ago, or yesterday, I should say. But anyway, uh, if you go to Volume 5, I did an article on um, Daylight, okay? And so check that out, and that's basically what I'm talking about. And that's just the, the highs are less than the moving averages for downtrends, or the lows are greater than the moving averages for uptrends. And that simple technique can really help to keep you on the right side of the market, and if you follow that, for the most part, since 2009, you would have been long this particular market. And still, we have pretty good daylight in here. Now, some people are arguing about, oh, it's a rising triangle wedge or whatever. Let's not get too caught up in that. Let's just continue to watch the market. But, yes, you could argue that there's a trend line coming up, meaning to this uh, top part here. But I'm not going to worry about that too much, okay? Yeah, hi, uh, Harry, we'll get to that. Is it Harry or Harry? Hope I got your name right. So let's take a look at the Russell 2000. Now, the Russell 2000 sort of looks like a head and shoulder top, and it looks ugly. But like I've been saying quite a bit, all we need is a couple of big up days. And that would negate that pattern. In fact, I learned very early in my trading, and then it was later confirmed by a book by, I think it was Van Thorpe. Uh, if not, I'll give him credit. But Van Thorpe wrote about, uh, I'm pretty sure it's him, he wrote about the Hound of the Baskervilles, and that's, uh, there was a murder at, on the estate, and the dogs didn't bark. So he deduced that, um, Sherlock Holmes might have even deduced, that it was an inside job, because if it was an outside job, somebody would have, somebody from outside the plantation or whatever, estate, I guess, a plantation, I'm talking to my southern speak, but somebody from outside of the estate, uh, the dogs would obviously bark at strangers. And uh, so sometimes it's like his his point is that you get a pattern like a head and shoulders looks like the market's gonna roll over and it does just the opposite. Okay, so we do have a head and shoulders here, and it does look a little toppy, but all it would take would be a few big updates. Now the Russell kind of frustrates me because it, it just has like a huge update like yesterday, it goes up one percent and you think everything's fine, 
and then it comes right back in. So wait for this thing to clear those old highs decisively before getting too excited about it. I mean, at the least, it's hanging in there. Now, you have to realize that as long as you're at or near all-time highs, you want to continue to err on the side of longer-term trend. So with the case of this one, the Russell, you're within a percent and a quarter of all-time highs. And then yesterday, you were within a percent of all-time highs. So the same thing goes for the P, same thing goes for the NASDAQ, all-time closing highs in the NASDAQ at least. So as long as you're at or near new highs, uh, don't worry about it, okay? Oh, it's Elder. Okay, Alexander Elder, my, my apologies. I, you know, I've I, I read, I'm looking at my bookshelf. The only reason I keep most of these books, just so it looks smart if somebody comes in my office, but uh, most of them, I, I don't remember getting much good out of them. But yeah, Elder, I've got some good stuff from him. Uh, Thorpe, I've got a few things from him. Although the, me and uh, Van Thorpe don't always agree on everything, and that's fine. That's what makes a market. Um, but Alexander Elder, okay, thank you for that. Okay. Hari, okay, is that better? <laughs> Okay, yeah, we'll get the individual stocks in just one second. Just uh, sit tight. Got a couple things to go over, and then we'll get there. Um, what's kind of interesting is the market, everything's kind of cooking, and everything's beginning to unwind a little bit. Let's take a look at, like, the TLT. Uh, this is uh, bonds. Now, I'm glad to see them get a little bit of a pop today based on the weakness in the market, although they're off their best levels already. But it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that the TLT – is not in really good shape okay and notice we talked about this a couple of weeks ago you had that big sharp retrace rally installed short of the prior highs so that confirmed that the top is in place and then we had bow ties and first thrust and other signals way back here that suggests that a top was in place so not looking good for the bonds unfortunately so if you back the chart way out you can see that um, they could have a long ways to go it's not the absolute level of interest rates that's important. It's the delta in rates. And I, I showed my age last night in, in the trading service. I said, uh, I remember when bonds were about 9%, if memory serves. And I remember when they ticked down to like 8 and 3 quarter percent and the market just went straight up. It's like it was just a, it was a fantastic market. Well, that's bonds at 8 and 3 quarter percent. The market's rallying. Isn't that crazy? Well, it's not the, the actual rate of bonds. It's the delta that gets people all excited. So we all know that higher interest rates are coming. We just don't know how the market is going to adjust to it. And sometimes people tend to sell first and then ask questions later uh, in that market eventually adjust to it. So this has got to be really concerned, the fact that bonds are headed lower. But as long as the indices can hang in there, I'm not going to get too excited about that just yet. Also, a lot of the more speculative issues that I trade don't necessarily uh, worry or have anything to do with the bond markets. If I'm trading a stock that has an HV of, let's say, 70, which is a little bit high, but not too high, then I know that that stock can trade quite independently of whatever the interest rates are doing. But eventually, if the overall market starts getting hit, that sentiment goes out into all stocks, even the more speculative ones. So it pays you, you, you get paid to pay attention. And you have to watch everything, unfortunately. Now, something kind of interesting is the dollar is also topping out. Keep in mind, when the dollar goes down, commodities go up. Because at least at this point in time, commodities are dollar denominated. So... If the dollar goes down, it's going to take more dollars to buy some oil. If the dollar goes up, your dollar is going to be stronger and it can buy more oil. So there's an inverse relationship as a general statement. I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but as I said quite often, you got to be careful with intermarket technical analysis because it only matters when it matters. There's a decoupling. There's long lead and lag cycles. There's a lot of – it's a complex world. And, and let me tell you this, unfortunately for us, if, you, if you're just learning about intermarket technical analysis, you could really scratch your head quite a bit. But I have to tell you, 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, intermarket technical analysis was a beautiful thing, and it worked really, really well. You could look at bonds and figure out what stocks were to do. If you could figure out one market, you could figure out 
a lot of other markets. Unfortunately, now it only matters when it matters. So when those things are coupled or decoupled, whatever the case may be, or uh, in agreement or inverse, because some markets have inverse relationships, some markets have uh, coupling type of things. So it only matters when they matters. When they're doing what they're supposed to do, you want to pay attention. When they're not doing what they're what they're supposed to do, don't worry about it so much. Okay. But again, you got to watch everything. So dollars in trouble in here so far. Now, as you would expect in the sectors, most of them look like the overall market or most of them, I should say, are sideways. Some areas like drugs are kind of hanging around their old highs, like the overall market. Biotech, a little bit more suspect, but at least it's around its old highs in here. And then the civvies had the mother of all pop recently. And unfortunately, they've come back in since then. But they had to come unglued. They're still towards their old highs. But again, we'd like to see a lot of these areas bust out the new highs before looking to establish new positions. Or just make sure you think you have the mother of all setups or something like an IPO, which might be able to defy the overall market. So most areas sideways. Some areas hanging in there towards their old highs. You got areas like transports, which have broken down. And so far, they're just pulling back a little bit. It looks like the mother of all tops is in place there. Now, I'm not a Dow theorist. And I don't get too excited about the uh, transports breaking down. But I do have to, when I'm making my positive negative columns, I do have to put that in a negative column because it certainly does score as a negative. That's not a good thing that the transports are ahead and lower. But I'm not going to rush out and sell all my stocks and say the sky is falling just because the transports aren't confirming what's happening in the overall market. The old Dow theory was that the rails and the transports, you have you make goods and you have to move the goods. Well, as Doug Newberry put up, pointed out when we were talking about the civvies breaking out last week, I think it was on a show last Friday or whenever, and the civvies were breaking out or whatever it was. Uh, it might have been last Wednesday night. I, my days are mixed up, especially with the holiday in there and all. But anyway, you know, his point was that the 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 could could be considered like the new – uh, transports of, of the future. And if you think about it, these cloud companies, which we're, uh, we're going after a few, we've got like a cloud advertising type of company in the portfolio now. Uh, all this electronic stuff, that could be maybe the, the super highway of the future, okay? Because a lot of these things are being delivered electronically. What am I doing now? Well, I am using my Citrix account, go to webinar, to do a webinar, so I'm delivering this this product electronically. Okay, so that's a kind of an interesting argument that Doug uh, Newberry brought up. So anyway, all time highs transports, and I'd be willing to bet we have a bow tie in here. Yeah, you got a bow tie down of all time highs. More importantly, though, uh, you've got a breakdown out of the sideways range, and so far you're just getting a little throwback to that range, and it's going to have a hard time. Getting uh getting through this thing. Okay, yeah, th another confirmation about uh, Alexander Elder. I think that's his name, Alexander. Okay. Uh, just a couple of more things in here, real quick. If you take a look at the energies, if I could find them, here we go. Uh, we're still long some energies. We're still long USO. I, I still think USO has potential, but the energy stocks, as you can see. Keep dropping, and then with today's action in here, it's they're beginning to look a little dubious, okay? And metals and mining are looking even worse. Metals and mining appear to be returning back to their old lows, okay? Now, I recently got asked about a few metals and mining stocks that I recommended not so long ago. We caught a, a wave in a few of them, and I was asking, I was getting asked about some of my Landry lists, and the reason I'm saying now is to pass on those is based on the action in overall metals. So you can't fall in love with the sector. You can't fall in love with your stocks. Remember that these stock things, these things called stocks, are for trading, okay? And that's what we do, and that's how we roll, okay? And one of the philosophical things I've been thinking of lately, and I'm putting in my little note program, is 
the fact that every trade has an ending, okay? In fact, take it one step further, I back it up a little bit. Every trade has a beginning, every trade has a middle, every trade has an ending. Kind of like life, and kind of like any of the events in life. And I don't want to die, I don't want to get too far off on this tangent, but just realize that there's going to be a beginning, there's going to be a time for you to get into the trade, there's going to be a time for you to hold on to the trade, and then there's going to be a time for you to exit that trade. And hopefully that exit will be two years from now or ten years from now, but it might be two hours from now or it might be two days from now or two weeks from now. We caught a good pop in these things. We were feeling pretty good, okay? And then we got stopped out of the remainder. So what? You get paid to trade. You need to look at your screens and then shout thank you, and then after that shout next and move on, okay? If you need a little motivation, um, I've got Shia in here after the web. Don't, don't put it on now, but um, after the webinar, you could um, pull up Shia. He's on my website. Let me show you. He's right here on the home page. So pull up, pull up Shia. Give you a little, get you pumped up to trade. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's, um, I think that's enough. Uh, it's kind of mixed out there. Overall, things are looking okay. When you see areas begin to take off, like the metals, go for it. Have a stop in mind. Have a profit target, initial profit target in mind. Try to trail it or try to stick with it as long as you can. When you get knocked out, you say so long and thanks for all the fish. Steve says, nice presentation, COWN. All right, let's open it up for – or let's keep it open for individual issues. Yeah, this looks good, uh, Steve, but it's not set up, okay? So, yeah, by all means, this should go on your momentum list. But there's nothing to do with this just yet until it sets up. Now, the other thing, too, is – it really hasn't cleared the top of its little range in here by much. So for me to get really excited about it, it would have to clear it a little bit further and then pull back. But by all means, put that on your watch list. What are the brokers doing? I'm just kind of curious here. Let's uh, jump to the sub industry. Yeah, these brokers are kind of hanging in there. As you can see, this is at least the national broker. So they're hanging in there. Okay. Shay had to go, but he wanted to learn about – he wanted to know about NQ, so we'll cover it uh, for the recording. Yeah, this is one that I have on my momentum list. It looks to me like a nice emerging trend. This is what I would call a, uh, a Phoenix stock because it's beginning to rise from the ashes. It has a little bad memories back here, but that's a ways above the market and it's a ways back in time, so I think it has potential, and it doesn't have to go – that much for to get past it uh but it's not set up okay so it would have to it would have to pull back in here to set up but yeah by all means put that on your momentum list okay rwlk looks like it formed a bottom and reversing even though a little ways yeah i love i like i love it yeah i think i like it i, I do like that stock or or wlk okay yeah um the reason I don't have this as a recommendation for today, it's a little bit on the thin side, as you can see, only 100,000 and something shares or less than 200,000 shares. It does have some overhead supply, but I have to tell you, this one keeps catching my eye every time I do my scans. It's also one of these Phoenix IPO stocks, okay? It got a little far ahead of itself, but then it absolutely imploded. If you watch the IPO course, what did I say? A lot of times they fly, they die. Well, in this particular case, there was no trade to be made in the beginning, and it got a little far ahead of its further, too far ahead of itself, and then it imploded. But I do like these IPOs once they come down and bottom out and then take off again. I think that's a great trading pattern or a great strategy in and of itself. So this RWLK does keep catching my eyes. I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to the IPOs, just like when it comes to commodity-related stocks because they tend to be a little more choppier. Uh, because IPOs tend to be more speculative and can make some incredible moves and, and somehow push through that resistance, okay? I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to them. So I do like this one. This overhead resistance has bothered me a little bit, but I think it's a decent stock. But the, that's the only reason why I'm not taking this trade. 
Uh, but I do think as a swing trade, it has a potential to at least pop into this overhead resistance. You also have a little bit of a gap here, which is kind of cool. And it's kind of like, a, I guess you'd call that like a cup and a handle. And I bet you 50 bucks if we put a bow tie in there. You probably got a bow tie or close to it. Yeah, close to it. Not quite a bow tie, but certainly enough other stuff going for it. Except, again, a lot of overhead supply. So I think I would hold off on that one. But I have to say, it's a good-looking stock. Uh, almost high five worthy. Don wants to know about F. What, what did – okay, let's just draw uh, – we drew an arrow. Let, you know, I'm just going to leave the arrows on a chart. Each week we're going to draw a new arrow. Uh, so, uh, yeah, new lows in that. Nice job, Don. <laughs> I hope you're short. <laughs> the new rule is we're going to pick on Don every time he brings up Ford. He's like the hunter in the woods. Um, this one's kind of interesting. Who's asking about this? James. James, this is kind of interesting. It's a relatively new issue. Um, it just looks a little extended to me. It had this big run higher, and it pulled back. It is still a relatively new issue again. I think it looks okay. Um, I'm just wondering if if we could find something a little bit better. And we have some newer trends that are emerging in a couple of these IPOs as opposed to going after this one. So it looks okay. Just this run here is fairly extended in here, and that's got me a little bit nervous on that one. Okay. CMCM. -CM. I think that's on my momentum list. Um, you know, another case where it just kind of looks extended, it kind of went straight up, and it didn't really pull back enough, and it didn't really clear this prior high in here enough for my taste. So I think I'd pass on this one, but it, it wouldn't hurt to put it on your momentum list to see if it could make some new highs and then pull back along the way. Greg wants to know about Momo. Momo. This is a fun. This has been a fun IPO. There it is. Um, what aggravated me about this one is that we really didn't have any structure to get in. It came down and based really nicely in here, and then it just pops up, okay? Uh, and based on the magnitude, it went up 100% over a few days. If you're long, stay long, okay? But as if you took the IPO course, you know there's definitely something to new closing highs at IPOs. Great pattern to trade, okay? I'm not going to give the whole pattern away. But as far as the core methodology, you really don't have a setup. But if it pulls back a little bit more, it'd be a little dangerous, okay? HV's get a little high in here. Again, it's ran 100% over a few days. So I'd be really careful with it, but maybe if it pulls back a little bit, it's going to be a very speculative position, though. Just make sure you don't bet the form on that. MX? Uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting. Oh, Don. Don, Don, Don. Is this unadjusted for splits? No. Uh, no, you got to go, you got to gap down from 15. Anybody who owns it at 15 is going to be looking to bail out as soon as this thing begins to rally. So avoid that like the plague. That's horrible looking. AVY. Yeah, this looks good. Who's uh, Shay? That's very good. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this stock because it's, it's much lower in volatility. Okay. And if you back the chart out, it's certainly done well longer term, um, ex except for that little spill in 2014. I do like the fact that it got off on a gap, and I do like the fact that it persisted higher and pulled back. Um, I think it's a fantastic-looking setup. The volatility is a little low, though, okay? So it's it's gone. It's like it's taken a long time to go uh, any, a, a long ways, or a long time to go short ways, I should say. So I would personally not trade it based on that. But if you're trying to learn the methodology and you take your scaling out, okay, this is a good-looking chart. You got a base breakout on a nice gap, okay? I mean, this is a fantastic-looking chart. You got a nice base breakout, okay? And look at this fake out. It looked like it was breaking down in here. And what it did? What, what it did? What it do? <laughs> what did it do? You got a nice gap higher. You got a nice persistent trend higher, and then you got a pullback. Okay. Now you could argue if you back the chart way, way out, you could argue that it's priced for perfection because it's gone up significantly. Okay, over a long period of time, and maybe uh, all the analysts in the world are looking at it and expecting them to 
they're going to have to just get perfect earnings and everything else. But as far as a, technic a technical perspective, without confusing the issue with much facts, it does look fantastic. But again, the volatility is just too low for me. Notice this pullback is only a two-point pullback, okay? We've got some stocks and that's uh, percentage-wise. What's that, about uh, 3 or 4%, if that much, 3%. That's not much if you think about it. But yeah, fantastic looking stock, absolutely. But I would I would avoid it because uh, it's too low. Greg, we can't talk about that one. Are you in the service? Because that, that's on the service. I'm sorry. But yeah, good job. High five. I'm struggling with HV. I don't have it on my package. What are you using? Um, because you could use um, – there's some other things you might be able to use. You said uh, AVY has bad memories. Yeah, those – I mean, that's – we're going back on a monthly chart all the way back to 2007. That's a long, long ways, but I hear you. I mean, you can't completely ignore that, but uh, it's far enough back in time to where I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, and, and then I'm always asked to quantify these things. So that's a case where, eh, 2007, it's 10 years, right? Or not quite. Well, how many years is that? Eight years? So it's a ways, it's a ways back, but a good eye on that, okay? S-Box, I'm not a big fan of Starbucks. It's just a big, um, it's a big thick stock. Look at your HV. It's got an HV of 20. Okay. That's not very impressive for an HV. What's the P's? The P's are 10. What's the Rusty? Rusty's 13. What's the Quack? Quack's 13 too. Okay. So it's not that much more volatile than the overall market. If you want to beat the market, and some people may argue otherwise, but I'll be happy to take that argument, you're not going to beat the market with stocks that are less volatile or the same volatility than the overall market. Now, I know you could argue, well, 20 is more than the market, but 20 is still pretty low. You're much better off trading a stock that has a higher volatility. And again, I've done webinar after webinar on that. Now, Let's throw that aside and let's let's draw some lines on the chart. It's at 52. Where was it yesterday? 50 something, 50 something, 50 something. Let's go back in time. So you've gone, how long have you gone? You've gone two months? No, no, no. One month and change. And the stock has done absolutely nothing. So draw your arrow and it's going sideways. So that's not a stock that you want to be trading let me just see if i can without giving anything away uh, uh let me think of something here i can't it escapes me but you want to be you want to be in stocks that are headed higher hd is a short no 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 draw your draw your lines and then you got a gap up here and then let's take a look at your let's take a look at your HV. Uh, your HV is 17. So now I need to program HV into my software. Not exactly sure about the formula and how many days applies as parameter. Uh, just Google it. Um, that's that's what like the Metastock formula. I could give you. I have to dig it out. But I just Googled it, and that's where I got it. And back in my first book, if you have Dave Landry and Swing Trading, I walk you through how to calculate HV. So that's there, but you could just do a Google and find it. I'll give you a telechart, but the telechart formula is uh, is just ridiculously long because the telechart is not very robust when it comes to indicators. Uh, Metastock is very robust when it comes to indicators, but it's it's like each charting package has its advantages. And I do love Metastock for certain things, but I also use um, telechart for a lot of things, and that's why I'm I'm banging away at telechart today. Is because I like it a lot. Uh, the thing about it too is you can look at a lot of stocks really quickly, as you see. Okay. Uh, Greg says HV and Trade Station is called Volatility Standard Deviation. Why did why did they change the name of that? It used to be called Statistical Volatility, uh, and those two terms are interchangeable. Okay, F E Y E, F E Y E. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, it's it's trending higher. Um, yeah, it's possible. I mean, this is kind of a it's still what I call a toddler. It's a, it's a, um, by only out a few years, couple of years in here. Uh, you know, you do have some problems back here, but I wouldn't worry about those too much because it looks like they're kind of getting their act together. 
Now it really hasn't cleared its prior highs too much just yet. So for me to get excited about it, it would have to clear them decisively and then and then pull back. Let me see something here. Control M. Oops. Control M. I can do it. But you can see this has been on my list before, and it's it's popped. It showed itself up at a couple lists, and I keep it in my. Uh, it's popped up here and there. But uh, it's not set up right now. But maybe on a pullback, it might be worth a shot. Okay. All right. Any more? Got a quiet bunch today. And I do need to check into that. Uh, that registration so thanks for the uh, heads up on that okay any more gone once you know the other thing I forgot to do too is I used to send I, I normally send out a reminder uh, before the webinars too I need to get in the habit of doing that okay uh, while we're at impasse I want to thank everybody for coming I appreciate you taking time in your busy schedule to be here I know everybody's got a uh, busy lives so I appreciate that uh, as you can tell, I enjoy doing these shows. I have a blast. So um, as long as you keep showing up, I'll continue to do them. And sorry about the registration. I'll uh, I'll get that fixed uh, for next week. Okay. Uh, if we don't talk again, everybody have a fantastic week in, and uh, everybody have a fantastic week. I'll see you guys, hopefully, and girls, again next Thursday. Thank you so much.